They were larger than life, equipped with the deadliest of weapons, their world and physiology so alien as to be almost unimaginable. Almost. But the process of attempting to envision the often nasty, brutish, and sometimes short lives of these monsters from the past has never stopped since the first fossil was pulled from the ground. What we're looking at here is actually a paleo crime scene. To call Therizinosaurus a monster wouldn't take a stretch of the imagination. We want to know about their lifestyles, about their habits. For millions of years, they swam the seas, soared across the skies, and ruled the Earth. Now we unearth their secrets. Simple animal life first appeared on Earth some 600 million years ago. Since then, billions of species have existed, but 99.9% .9 of them are now extinct. What they left behind are their fossils, pieces of history that offer clues to life millions of years ago. What can this shattered skull tell us about the 70 million year old death of a top marine predator? And why would a giant herbivore need a set of five foot claws? And what did flightless dinosaurs do with the covering of feathers? The challenge for scientists is to put flesh back on the bones. To figure out what these monsters really looked like. And how they lived and died. And what their world was like. Using the latest science and technology, we're going to revisit some of the most lethal, terrifying, and bizarre creatures that ever saw the light of day on planet Earth. Hundreds of millions of years of bones lie beneath our feet. It takes a lot of dirty work to get these fossils to give up their secrets. We're here along the Rocky River in Cleveland, Ohio, looking at a spectacular outcrop of the Cleveland Shale. This beautiful rock layer was deposited at the later part of the Devonian period of geologic time. The Earth was a radically different place some 400 million years ago. During the Devonian period, all the world's land masses sat around the equator in the form of two supercontinents, Euramerica and Gondwana. A global ocean surrounded these gathered continents and water covered much of what is today dry land, including Cleveland, Ohio. The rock layers here represent a deposit at the bottom of a sea that once covered parts of the continent. Geologists call that an epicontinental sea. The sea covered this area at least several hundred feet deep, perhaps even much deeper. The denizens of this sea included fish and a whole host of sharks. These fish preyed upon each other as well as various kinds of invertebrates that lived in the upper parts of the water. The ocean's most lethal hunter was Dunkleosteus. It belonged to a group of armored predators called placoderms, or platy-skinned fish, that ranged in size from the 30-foot, four-ton Dunkleosteus to tiny fish no larger than several inches. The placoderms hunted the global seas during the Devonian period, but none rivaled Dunkleosteus. It's probably the biggest, baddest fish that lived at the end of the Devonian era. It's one of the top predators that's ever swum in the oceans of the Earth since life evolved several billion years ago. 
Despite its power and killer whale size, Dunkelosteus' legacy has proven to be fragile. Unlike their Devonian competitors, descendants of the armored placoderms don't exist today. Our clues about Dunkelosteus come from the only physical evidence that survives, fossilized dermal armor that covered the front end of the fish. Armor that after death would have dragged Dunkelosteus to the bottom towards preservation. Once the bone settles to the bottom, a protective layer of sediment must cover it in order to fossilize. In the vast majority of cases, this doesn't happen and the animal just decays away, just like roadkill you might see along a highway. Fossilization is actually a very rare thing to happen to any given specimen of bone or shell or a leaf. 99.9% .9 of everything that's ever lived doesn't fossilize and we don't have it in the fossil record. If the bone is covered by sediment, then water flowing through the pore spaces of the bone can precipitate minerals out in the little crevices in the bone. Those minerals then turn into a representation of the bone and all the original organic material decays away. Fossils of Dunkelosteus' armor plating reveal a beautiful bone structure that made this animal into a model, predator. The top of the head is almost like a drawbridge. There are two hinges on either side of the skull, and there's actually this large soft tissue opening right here. When Dunkelosteus had seen a predator or seen a prey item in front of it and wanted to attack it, it would drop its lower jaws down, but this thing would lift the top of the skull up like a drawbridge. Based on their study of fossils, scientists restored the musculature to a computer model of Dunkelosteus' skull they were able to determine that the creature's four jaw joints worked in concert to open and close with force and speed. The length of time it would take to go from a closed mouth to an open gap was less than a 50th of a second. You'd have a big suction formed by the sudden opening, and anything that was swimming in front of it would actually get drawn back towards the mouth. And as soon as these shearing jaws come together, you've got that animal cut in half. Dunkelosteus has a bite force roughly equivalent to Tyrannosaurus rex, which has absolutely the largest bite force that we've ever measured for any vertebrate animal. This would also rival an alligator's bite, which is the strongest of any living animal. Amazingly, despite how lethal Dunkelosteus was, this placoderm was technically toothless. Dunkelosteus didn't have teeth like fish such as sharks have or many modern fish. It didn't have a whole bunch of teeth set into a jaw, but instead had protrusions of the bones. Through natural selection and evolution, the plates that form the lower jaws have actually become thin, elongate, like cleaver blades, and you actually have several points coming up on these things. And they were essentially self-sharpening. When the lower jaws moved against the bony plates of the upper jaw, it was just like sharpening a knife. But much of reconstructing Dunkelosteus remains an act of imagination. When we're trying to reconstruct an animal like Dunkelosteus here, the only thing you have to work with is the actual skeleton. We have to imagine what the eyes would look like in the eye socket, what sort of covering would there be over the plates that form the teeth, and what sort of skin would be over this body. As a paleontologist, what we want to do is draw modern analogs. When we're looking at things like placoderms, this is a whole group of vertebrates that went extinct. There are no modern analogs to this. Though armored fish no longer exist, Dunkelosteus' closest living relatives are sharks. If you can use some kind of modern animal to say something about any kind of behavior, you know, because it truly is speculation. I mean, the, the suspects are dead. Essentially what geologists and paleontologists are doing is we're all trying to figure out the plot of the same movie. But that movie has been cut into frames and those frames have been scattered outside and left out in the weather for hundreds of millions of years. When you go to a geological formation, you have one frame of that movie and then another scientist somewhere else in the world may have the next frame. And then from those individual snippets, you have to try to reconstruct the history of life on Earth with a lot of time missing. Given nature's incessant predator-prey storyline, 
the plot often revolves around a murder mystery, as it does in the case of these Mosasaur bones tucked away in the basement of the Sternberg Museum of Natural History in Hayes, Kansas. The bones of this marine reptile, who hunted the seas some 300 million years after Dunkleosteus, are evidence of a 70 million year old regicide, the death of a king. They were the rulers in the ocean. There was nothing else out there that could threaten a Mosasaur except another Mosasaur. They were pretty much loners. They, they were long distance swimmers. This animal was found in what would have been the middle of the Western Interior Sea, hundreds of miles from the nearest land. He was perfectly adapted for living at sea for his entire life. Mosasaurs evolved from coastal marine lizards which hunted in the ocean, but returned to the land. During the late Cretaceous from 89 to 65 million years ago, they took to the sea for good and grew into 50-foot sea monsters. Sea levels were higher in this period. 85% of the earth was covered in water, as opposed to 71% today. Mosasaurs were more plentiful in these abundant oceans than were the large, more famous dinosaurs that at this time squeezed onto relatively small portions of land. The Western Interior Seaway stretched from Texas into Canada and from the Rockies to the Appalachians. Roughly the size of the Mediterranean. Very shallow, um, 600 foot maximum depth, at least in Kansas. So it was, it was a shallow, warm water sea, probably semi-tropical in nature. This sea was full of life and extremely dangerous. What we have here is the skull of a mosasaur that was killed, evidently, by a much larger mosasaur. And we can tell that because of things like the bite marks that show up on the bones of this particular skull. It appears that another mosasaur attacked this one. And this guy's about 15 or 16 foot long, probably attacked by something that was uh, 20, 21 foot long, much heavier. But these guys were midgets compared to the heavyweight of the mosasaur family, Tylosaurus, who at 50 feet was the size of a bus, weighed several tons and had a four foot skull. The skull is equipped with a very large set of heavy conical teeth that the Mosasaur used for seizing and killing animals. They're not cutting teeth, they're not like the teeth of T-Rex that the animal would be tearing apart prey. This guy just swallowed what he caught. He swallowed it whole, very much like a modern snake. He was actually able to ratchet his head around the prey and pull it in complete. One way to look at a mosasaur is to envision it as, as a large snake. Yes, it still had four limbs, but it swam through the water using its tail. Mosasaur has about 130 vertebrae in its body, but 100 of those are in the tail. It literally uses that part of its body to move itself through the water very efficiently. From the looks of his remains, our smaller mosasaur victim didn't quite retreat efficiently enough. From the bite marks that we can see on both sides of the skull, it looks like the attacker came from the left side. When he bit down on this mosasaur skull, it basically collapsed the skull. The two jaw bones come flattened together against the roof of the mouth, and we see some breakage inside of the teeth that are on the, the hard palate of the mosasaur. And then it looks like he twisted the head of the smaller mosasaur to the point that the neck was probably broken. We'd have the neck vertebra coming off here at a 45 degree angle, which is very unusual for any kind of a mosasaur specimen. The larger mosasaur probably let him go and the smaller mosasaur sank to the bottom and was simply preserved as we found it uh, 50 years ago. This fairly routine 70 million year old murder tells us a host of information about the reclusive, confrontational lives of mosasaurs. I'm sure that the larger mosasaur had no intention of eating this guy. He was too big. Mosasaurs would not um, attack for food anything larger than they could swallow. 
In this case, it was a territorial thing or a mating thing. You have two bull mosasaurs going at it with each other. And this guy loses because he's just, he's the underweight. He's the featherweight compared to the, the 800 pound gorilla that attacked him. They were solitary animals for one thing, and maybe just being in proximity to another animal was enough to enable some aggressive activity. We do know, however, that mosasaurs uh, fought with each other fairly consistently. Lots of mosasaur remains have got broken bones or healed bite marks. It's very evident from the fossil record that these things uh, did not live together uh, harmoniously. They tended to fight each other a lot. So to pry open a door onto the past, a paleontologist must be part forensic pathologist. We can see bite marks, or we can see the teeth of other animals, or evidence of digestion, or pathologies that may in include things like cancer or, or even arthritis in some animals. Those are important bits of information that tell us more about these creatures and how they lived. But just what exactly was going on inside a mosasaur's gigantic head? Brain size is small. Even the largest mosasaurs, the brain was not much larger than, say, your index finger. A lot of the responses, a lot of the activity of uh, a mosasaur was purely instinctive. They didn't sit around thinking about the condition of the world or anything. They were, they were active predators, and that's what they did. The mosasaurs dominated the seas before becoming extinct 65 million years ago. But mosasaurs might not seem quite as bizarre as giant insects, like this dragonfly that grew to the size of a hawk and hunted the skies of the Carboniferous period 300 million years ago. We go through a great deal of effort to control our environments and to make them comfortable inside and out. But there are few things that destroy our peace of mind, like insects. And yet, they're everywhere, above us, beneath our feet, and in our food. But it could be worse, much worse. They could be giants. Is this just fantasy? Paranoid 1950s style science fiction? Maybe so, but for a period in Earth's distant history, giant insects were a fact of life. Imagine a huge dragonfly with a wingspan of about three feet. This dragonfly, Meganura, was one of the most aggressive predators 300 million years ago. Paleontologists now find mostly wings as fossils because those are the sturdiest parts of the body that usually survive uh, fossilization. So for all the giants, there are only some body parts found and the paleontologists have to puzzle the pieces together and guess the actual size of the animal from scaling relationships of living animals or complete fossils that they found from other uh, times. During the Carboniferous period, many parts of the Earth were a swampy smorgasbord for this oversized insect. The environment was pretty warm, and it was a time where a lot of plants started to grow. The first forest existed. The world was very humid and moist, so it was a time where there was a lot of abundance of new habitats and abundance of, of food and, and shelter. Meganora buzzed overhead preying on insects and even small amphibians that it snatched up with its legs. On the ground below, Arthropleura, a six-foot giant millipede-like creature, skittered through the swamps on 30 pairs of legs. The largest land arthropod may have eaten as much as one ton of vegetation a year. There was no predator on land that was big enough or strong enough to break through its hard exoskeleton. We call it a sow bug on steroids. It's not an insect, but it's related to parts of arthropods, includes uh, the crustaceans and the millipedes. So it would have reminded you of a giant a centipede or a sow bug, but a gigantic of eight, nine feet long in some specimens. There weren't many predators around on the land during the Carboniferous, so it was a very good time to be an invertebrate. 
it's certainly the largest land animal alive at that time and any kind of either plant or animal debris that it wanted to eat, it could eat, but it doesn't need to be a great predator at a time when there's so much food available. The world was ruled by arthropods still. Even the cockroaches are huge, they were a foot long. Scientists suspected that plentiful food and relative safety were not enough to make superbugs possible. If that were all it took, they might still be around today. But there was another significant environmental difference during the Carboniferous period. Plant life was doing so well in the Carboniferous, pumping lots of oxygen into the atmosphere. Part of it may also be that a lot of these forests were growing in wet, swampy environments. And when that plant material is then preserved in those environments, you're sequestering carbon in those environments. So if you're taking out carbon from the atmosphere, you're changing the ratio between oxygen and carbon in the atmosphere. Researchers suspected that higher oxygen levels during the Carboniferous period were key to insect growth, but they didn't understand the connection. The secret to this mystery is under investigation just outside of Chicago, Illinois, at the Argonne National Laboratory, one of the U.S. Department of Energy's largest research centers. Scientists here suspect that the key to size has to do with how insects supply their bodies with oxygen and are looking for answers about insect respiration in this tiny beetle's body. The first thing that I do is to take the beetle and knock him out. I simply put him to sleep by giving him nitrogen gas. This is just temporary. It doesn't hurt the animal at all. Once the beetle has been properly subdued, he's ready for his close-up. What I'm doing here is placing the beetle on a stand that we can control from the outside. So we can move it up and down and side to side and position where we want it in the x-ray beam. Searching station C. Exit immediately. This tiny bug sits at the imaging end of one of the world's most massive x-ray machines. This is the advanced photon source. It is what we call a third generation synchrotron. This function is to produce very powerful X-rays. The synchrotron generates X-rays one billion times stronger than a hospital X-ray machine by accelerating electrons around a 1.1 kilometer track at close to the speed of light and harnessing the X-rays they emit. Teams of researchers work at stations around the track, accessing the two millimeter square laser-like x-rays for their experiments. What's the species again? This is Tenebrio, Tenebrio monitor. It's a mealworm beetle. Because of the strength of these x-rays, our team can see the beetle's respiratory system in action to understand how it works and how this system limits insect size. The analogy here is before we had x-rays in general, we knew that there was anatomy, and we knew there, you know, you have bones and muscles, but it'd be like only being able to dissect a dead human to go into being able to see the muscle movement and the bone movement all at once. That, that's how big of a, a leap this is for small animals like this. And the tracheal tubes, the key to insect breathing, turn out to be critical to insect size. Unlike vertebrates, who get oxygen from their lungs to their cells in their bloodstream, Insects transport oxygen through a series of tracheal tubes that runs from the surface of their exoskeletons out to their extremities where they dead end. And one of the trachea here is actually pumping. So you can see that uh, the band is contracting and expanding. This tracheal system is incredibly efficient at delivering oxygen, but with the help of the detailed x-rays, researchers were able to shed light on the limitations of this breathing design. With the high resolution x-rays, we can measure their anatomy and measure their details with precision that we've never done before. What researchers learned from their measurements of the trachea of tiny beetles and specimens as much as 1,000 times larger is that as you scale up in bug size, the trachea must grow disproportionately larger to maintain oxygen supplies. Insects' bodies place an upper limit on this growth. There's a very unique feature in insects, and this is that they have an exoskeleton. So they have a hard shell that confines the space for tissue inside of the body. 
So what they have to do is they have to pack all the tissue, all the things that they need to survive within this confined area that they have. And there are few places in the body uh, where this conf confinement is actually very important. The critical junctures in insects occur at their joints, areas where their exoskeletons pinch and they end up with traffic jams of trachea and tissue. It's right here where the leg is attached to the body. Through this orifice, insects have to supply the air. They have to connect uh, muscles by tendons. They have to uh, supply insect blood through that orifice into the leg. As beetles get bigger, the tracheal tubes begin to fill up the space in this orifice. A little math led researchers to a prediction of maximum bug size. When we increase the tracheal dimensions to a point where about 90% of this orifice is covered by a tracheal tube, the hypothetical beetle is about 16, 17 centimeters large. And this is about the size of the largest beetle that we have on Earth nowadays. It's a longhorn beetle, it's called Titanus, and it's a Central American animal. In our environment, bugs can get no bigger. But what if you had an environment 300 million years ago when oxygen levels were markedly higher? Oxygen levels in the Carboniferous atmosphere increased over time until they reached levels of between 30 and 35 percent, as opposed to today's 20 percent atmospheric oxygen concentrations. Because we had a better oxygen supply into those structures, insects could actually um, decrease the size and the dimensions of those tracheal tubes. Smaller tracheal tubes left more space for other tissues to grow. They essentially were superfueled arthropods during the Carboniferous with this enhanced level of oxygen. These theories are currently being put to the test. What my colleagues are doing at Arizona State University is rearing flies or other insects under different oxygen concentrations and see if they actually change their size or their tracheal dimensions. For example, fruit flies under higher and lower oxygen concentrations. And what they saw is that, yes, they get bigger as oxygen supply is higher, and they also reduce their tracheal dimensions. The giant insects and arthropods, like most eccentric life forms on the planet, were a passing phenomenon. But their creeping, crawling insect descendants are still with us and comprise roughly 95% of life on land. Birds are also still with us, and the connection between feathers and flight has long been understood. But new revelations in the fossil record are shaking up what we know about the evolution of feathers and which past monsters wore a downy coat. Timmy, what is it? It's a velociraptor. Raptors. They've been immortalized on screen as extra-large, cunning super predators. It's certainly an animal that would have been a formidable predator. And not an animal you would want to run into in a back alley. Moreover, raptors look like something terrifying, sent over from central casting. Swift, stealthy, with sickle-shaped claws on their back feet, powerful arms, and that chilling reptilian look. But the truth is often stranger and more complex than fiction. Most raptors were relatively small, and recent evidence indicates these dromaeosaurs, or swift reptiles, were actually related to birds and were covered in feathers. It is a shock. You go from this, these, scaly, uh, these scaly reptiles to what might, in an, in, a, in an instance like Velociraptor, be this really angry chicken. The angry chicken. It just doesn't have that marquee ring to it. But it does have the ring of truth, because feathers first appeared on dinosaurs. As birds evolved from dinosaurs, feathers became more substantial in order to be useful for flight. 
there are very few differences that you could point to between, say, a chicken and a T-Rex. Um, they have very, very similar anatomies, and that's because they have a common ancestor, and that common ancestor is not very far back in their lineage. This split on the evolutionary tree between the non-avian theropod dinosaurs and their smaller cousins, the raptors, and the first birds, Archaeopteryx, can't be pinpointed in time. But the two groups, one that would never fly and one that would dominate the air, share many physical characteristics, including feathers. The first sort of feathered dinosaurs um, that were clearly not birds were found around 1995. These fossils were coming out of China that had these really sort of halos of kind of feather fuzz around them, sort of very downy-like feathers. So it's not these asymmetrical, really modern feathers that most people are familiar with on birds. More recently, Alan Turner made a discovery that extended this downy covering to more flightless theropod dinosaurs, velociraptors found in Mongolia. This is the ulna of a velociraptor, so it's one of the lower limb bones, or the forelimb. And I found these bumps, these quill knobs along the back of the ulna which is where the ligament that attaches the feather embeds itself in the bone. They're actually quite small, so I felt them actually before I saw them. And these quill knobs can be found on modern birds. What's interesting about Velociraptor is it's one of the larger of the dromaeosaurs known that we actually have direct fossil evidence for its feathers. We have good reason to have predicted that these animals would have been feathered because we know their earlier, smaller relatives had feathers. Beyond cosmetics, these feathers are a further confirmation of the close connection between raptors and birds. They're not just dinosaurs, but they're actually a particular kind of dinosaur. They're embedded in the tree of life within the group of predatory dinosaurs. They're in fact more closely related to things like Velociraptor than Velociraptor is related to something like Tyrannosaurus. Though feathers are perhaps the most dramatic connection between raptors and birds, there are many similarities that are not just skin deep. When you look at a bird today, a lot of what you see is in fact dinosaur and not as much bird as you think. The hollow bones are in fact a theropod feature. Those are around for 210 million years. The wishbone that you see within a bird, that's also a theropod feature, evolved long before flight ever evolved. All those guys have, for example, a specialized wrist bone called a semilunic carpal. It does a big sort of flex motion like this, which in a predatory dinosaur is useful for grabbing prey. It is exactly the same motion that a bird does in their downstroke of a flight. And that's one of many, many anatomical characters that show us that birds are dinosaurs. But why did these features lead to flight in some dinosaurs and not in others? The whys of evolution are not an easy question for science to address because sometimes there, there may not be a why. Uh, it may just be sort of a happenstance of evolution that some of these features evolved and then happened to be advantageous. What we do know, at least about these features, is that they didn't evolve for flight and they just happened to be able to kind of be utilized for that behavior in the earliest birds. But if feathers appeared in raptors, for whom flight was an aerodynamic impossibility, did they serve some other purpose? Right now, sort of the leading ideas about why feathers might have evolved have to do with their role in thermoregulation. Around the time that we see the first feathers showing up in the fossil record, within these group of dinosaurs, um, you're seeing a big shift from being a very big theropod ant, like Allosaurus to going to be very small. So you're going from being multiple tons in, uh, in mass to being maybe just 10 or 15 pounds. As you get smaller, it's much harder to maintain high body temperatures. And these were probably fairly active animals. And the evolution of feathers was somehow adaptive for maintaining body temperature as these animals got small evolutionarily. Flight feathers were the last stages of feather evolution. Millions of years later, the evolution of the modern feather signaled the turning point from non-avian dinosaurs to Archaeopteryx, an animal that is recognizable as one of the earliest birds.
What we're looking at here are casts of the first and probably one of the best archaeopteryx specimens found. These are preserved in very fine-grained limestones, and that uh, preserve these impressions of the feathers that these animals had. What's probably most significant is all the things it doesn't have. You can look at its skull, and it still has teeth, just like all the other theropods do, but not like modern birds. So it really is this sort of um, kind of perfect transitionary animal. Just as these prehistoric creatures were constantly evolving, our understanding of them is almost always changing as well. Two seemingly disparate disciplines, art and science, intersect to reveal just how much and how little we really know about these ancient monsters. Therizinosaurus clawed its way into the fossil record, literally. The first evidence of these freakish creatures, a giant five-foot claw, was discovered in the late 1940s. The first thing they found were a few claws from the hand, and they were so unlike anything we'd ever seen before that the scientist who named them thought that they belonged to a turtle. When paleontologists discover any new creature, one of the first questions they ask is what did it look like? Paleo artists like Patrick O'Brien, who illustrate for museums and publications, are instrumental in this fleshing out process. So I'm picturing it must have been some truly huge prehistoric turtle with these um, giant claws on his four feet. But the turtle connection proved to be a mistake. The claws were actually the first clues to the discovery of a bizarre new animal. They began finding more and more pieces of more and more dinosaurs that were closely related to Therizinosaurus. So our um, image of what this animal was evolved a lot through time. So it turned out to be a new and strange kind of theropod dinosaur, and not a turtle at all. Therizinosaurus, who lived 70 to 75 million years ago during the Cretaceous period, was a theropod a group of almost exclusively carnivorous dinosaurs that included T-Rex. But at 40 feet long and three to six tons, Therizinosaurus's body had some odd features, an extended neck, a beaked head, and a pot belly that are typical not of carnivores, but of herbivores. Scientists were baffled. Therizinosaurs were an incredibly bizarre group of raptor dinosaurs. They weren't recognized as raptor dinosaurs for the first 50 years that they were discovered because they were so different from any other dinosaur we'd ever seen. The only way that the story got resolved was when we discovered exceptionally primitive forms. And those animals looked so much like raptor dinosaurs, but started to show some adaptations towards animals like Therizinosaurus that we were able to actually piece back the history and get at what the ancestry of these animals were. The missing link in this mystery is on display at the Utah Museum of Natural History. Discovered in 2005, Falcarius is the most primitive specimen of the Therizinosaur group. It lived 130 million years ago and marks the transition between the predatory raptor ancestors and their plant-eating Therizinosaur descendants. Falcarius still maintains a lot of anatomy that's similar to, say, Velociraptor. It still has a small body, powerful arms, but small claws. It is showing some changes that allow us to place it within Therizinosaurus. Its neck is starting to get longer, its head is starting to get longer. But basically, when you look at the skeleton of Falcarius, it's a raptor dinosaur with just a few changes that tell us that it just began to switch towards a new lifestyle. Falcarius's leaf-shaped teeth are the most telling pieces of its anatomy that indicate it had begun eating plants. The teeth are very well adapted for eating plant, plants rather than eating meat. These first steps towards herbivory grew more pronounced over millions of years of evolution 
There's about a 70 million year difference between Falcarius and Therizinosaurus. If you looked at the two of them side by side, you probably wouldn't recognize that they were closely related. Therizinosaurus's huge size and bizarre shape make it a good candidate for a full-scale rendering. But rendering is an ambiguous process. Representations of dinosaurs must include the illustrator's best guesses of coloration, skin covering, and even behavior based on the scientific evidence. On the computer, I created this drawing of a Therizinosaurus skull so that I could try out different soft tissues. First, I created an outline of the soft tissues with the muscles and skin. And then I thought I would try to sort of bird-like headgear, which is plausible on Therizinosaurus. They were feathered dinosaurs, and their relatives did evolve into birds. I also thought I would try to put more of a lizard-like headgear. This is exactly what modern-day iguanas have on the tops of their heads. Artistic judgment and scientific judgment may not be as far apart as we think. In both processes, what we know about these long extinct creatures is an approximation based on analogies and assumptions until definitive evidence is dug up that furthers knowledge. Science is this ongoing intellectual pursuit and that's kind of the beauty of it. You keep gathering data and keep putting forth these hypotheses and keep finding new lines of evidence. All along the way, this is a self-correcting scientific process. We find better specimens. We often have to revise what we thought about animals. But that's fine. That's the way it's supposed to be. There is fossil evidence that suggests features of Therizinosaurus's form and some behavioral surprises. Most of the scientists think that Therizinosaurus probably had a beak because you can see that they have teeth in the skull, but only in this back part here for chewing, and in the front they don't have any teeth at all. So they probably had a beak that looked something like that. Satisfied with these choices, Patrick begins to work with the whole animal. But the function of the massive claws is the thorniest issue. Some people have suggested they use these for spearing fish. And the hypotheses kind of run wild. They may have been used to scare away predators. They don't appear to be very good for actual defense. They may have also been for sexual selection. They may have been uh, a mating signal or um, just a sexy look for a Therizinosaur. Ultimately, Patrick's painted version incorporates the idea of the claws as food gatherers. Scientists theorize that Therizinosaurus may have pulled high vegetation down to its mouth to eat. He has also given the creature a pot belly, customary for animals that digest huge amounts of vegetation. Plants are much harder to metabolize for animals than flesh is. Think of it when you're eating a cow, you're turning a cow into human. That's kind of a smaller step than turning lettuce into a human. So it, it takes more time and more specialization than to be a herbivore. And one of the ways that herbivores deal with that issue is to have larger stomachs where they can uh, leave the food in there longer to, to get more of the nutrients out of it. Before the portrait is complete, Patrick must contend with one last detail that remains speculative. Most of the fossils of the close relatives of Therizinosaurus were found with feather impressions in the dirt. And so it's assumed that Therizinosauruses were also feathered, and they were probably these sort of downy, sort of thin feathers. They weren't, they weren't flight feathers. It certainly wasn't a flying creature. And were the feathers brightly colored for display or muted for camouflage? Since we don't have any 70 million year old Therizinosaur feathers, color must be determined by deduction. Therizinosaurs were very large. They probably weren't trying to bother to hide from anybody. So I'm going to guess that they're brightly colored with bright, bold patterns on them to impress other Therizinosaurs. To work with extinct creatures, you have to accept that a certain amount of mystery will never go away. It's all very speculative. Modern day creatures do things that you would never guess just from looking at their anatomy. Modern day whales who can dive to such great depths for such long periods of time. If you only were looking at the bones of these animals and you knew something about mammals, you wouldn't guess that a mammal could do that because mammals can't do that. They can't dive to such great depths 
and hold their breath for you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes at a time, and yet they do. So perhaps there were things like that the dinosaurs were doing that we just don't really know and we just can't know. We probably will never know. That's looking pretty good. Life on the ground in the Cretaceous was no picnic. But the dinosaurs couldn't look to the sky and imagine a kinder, gentler world. The sky was full of pterosaurs, some as big as small planes, and they weren't vegetarians. Quetzalcoatlus was a pterosaur, or flying lizard, the largest flying animal ever found. With a wingspan of 35 feet and weighing 165 pounds, these creatures flew over the heads of the dinosaurs. This is Quetzalcoatlus. The fossils have been found from Big Bend, Texas. It's a real Texan-sized animal. Pterosaurs were the first vertebrates to develop flight. During their 160 million year evolution from the late Triassic period until the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago, they grew from seagull-sized animals to flying giants like Quetzalcoatlus. Everything was a giant. The turtles were giants, the crocodiles were giants, and there were giant lizards. Even in the air, there were giant flying reptiles that we call pterosaurs. Quetzalcoatlus was safe in the air but he had to return to Earth for food. And this is where danger awaited. Fishing what was a fertile coastal wetland in Texas, he would have been vulnerable to attack. <laughs> Discovered in 1971, Quetzalcoatlus's size, as tall as a modern giraffe, may place it close to the physiological limit for flight. And this has become one of the focal points of study of the larger pterosaurs, how they managed to take off from the ground and how they flew. In order to fly efficiently, pterosaurs were extremely weight conserving. No pounds were wasted on their stick-like bodies. Pterosaurs were not very heavy, and one of the places that they saved a lot of weight was in the skeletons. Now, the actual wall of the bone is very thin. On a pterosaur, the wall bone is only about as thin as a sheet of paper. Over millions of years, flight and weight considerations may have caused the pterosaurs to evolve towards toothlessness, as they did in Tapahara, this Brazilian pterosaur from the Cretaceous period. This is, in a way, better arrangement because they got rid of the weight. For a flying animal, any way you could reduce the body weight is good. And this is why probably all birds have lost their teeth. For pterosaurs, evolution towards toothlessness may also have had to do with their diet of fish. Every animal that catches fish commonly has to have a system to rotate the fish around without letting go of it getting his head aimed the right way so that it can swallow it. The teeth get in the way for that. So if you have no teeth, then you can actually take the fish and walk it around and keep the jaws closed on it until you can swallow it. Pterosaurs also had a very innovative wing, similar to that of a bat. Pterosaurs built their wing in a very unusual way. What they did is they elongated their fourth finger and they had a flap of skin that extended from that finger back to the thigh bone and that made a wing. Pterosaurs flew actually by flapping their fourth finger. But the hunting behavior of these toothless flying reptiles remains a mystery. They might have sat on top of the water and just grabbed fish that were coming by the other possibility is that maybe they used these huge bills as skimmers that would skim along the surface of the water and actually catch fish on the move. 
but scientists are still trying to explain the large crest on these creatures' heads. We have here the orbit where the eyeball would fit, and then above it we have the crest that Pteranodon's famous for. And the crest might have been a counterbalance that helped to balance the effect of the bill if it was skimming the water. The other part of skin that extended from that finger back to the thigh bone, and that made a wing. Pterosaurs flew actually by flapping their fourth finger. But the hunting behavior of these toothless flying reptiles remains a mystery. They might have sat on top of the water and just grabbed fish that were coming by. The other possibility is that maybe they used these huge bills as skimmers that would skim along the surface of the water and actually catch fish on the move. But scientists are still trying to explain the large crest on these creatures' heads. We have here the orbit where the eyeball would fit, and then above it we have the crest that Pteranodon's famous for. And the crest might have been a counterbalance that helped to balance the effect of the bill if it was skimming the water. The other possibility is that it's simply an ornament. Think of it as wearing a hat. And uh, as such, uh, it might have been larger in the males. That's commonly the case. The, uh, in reptiles, the males are usually the, the showy individuals. But anatomical features often have more than one function. Some pterosaurs may have also used their crests as a rudder when floating on the water, their wings tilted up behind them like two sails. So basically, if they want to sort of cruising, you know, just feeding and moving around, this would be the ideal way of locomotion because they don't need any kind of muscular effort. It is like a three-masted sailing boat. Flight is an incredibly complex activity, particularly for a predator whose livelihood required tracking prey while aloft. A pterosaur's brain had to be able to handle loads of in-flight information. Looking at flying animals, whether it's pterosaurs or birds, we've always tended to focus on aerodynamics, and that makes perfectly good sense. One thing that's been kind of neglected, though, is actually looking at like what's going on in the cockpit. What is the flight control system like in these animals? And so what we can do then is actually compare the brain structure of birds and pterosaurs. An anatomy professor at Ohio University, Lawrence Whitmer creates three-dimensional brain images by CT scanning the fossilized skulls of extinct animals. There's a particular lobe of the brain called the flocculus that in birds is relatively large. In pterosaurs, it's absolutely enormous, much larger than what we see in birds. This presented a real question for us. Why did pterosaurs have such a huge flocculus? The flocculus receives sensory information from the body about the body's position and communicates it back to the brain, all of which is critical in maintaining a predator's gaze on its prey. So birds have a large flocculus, which makes sense. The question is, why did pterosaurs have such a large flocculus? And so it got me thinking, what is different about birds than, than pterosaurs? Birds' wings are made of feathers, which don't have nerve endings in them. But well-preserved pterosaur fossils reveal a wing that is made out of a thin membrane of skin. A skin that's richly supplied with nerve endings. And so what that suggested to me is that potentially the pterosaurs were receiving a huge amount of sensory information from that wing, communicating up through the spinal cord into that gigantic flocular lobe of the, of the cerebellum for processing. So pterosaurs' wings had more than just an aerodynamic function. In pterosaurs, what they've done is they've also turned their wing into an essentially a smart wing, a gigantic sensory organ collecting all kinds of information, potentially on things like airspeed, um, angle of attack, all of these kinds of things that would then be communicated back to the brain. This would then be coordinated with information on balance coming from the inner ear, and then relayed to the eye muscles to keep the gaze fixed on a target. A lot of effort 
to keep your eyes fixed on a target, but if you're a predatory animal, that's the difference between a meal and potentially no meal. Pterosaurs were indeed, in a sense, more highly attuned and sophisticated aerial predators than what we had thought before. It's almost like a sort of autopilot device. In other words, if there is a turbulence in the air, we would be able to pick it up and send information to the air, and the air will tell how to adjust. Our efforts to understand these creatures can take us on a journey inside their heads or out into the far reaches of their environment. Paleontologists and geologists attempt to envision prehistoric environments to better understand how they shape their inhabitants, including the largest predator of all time. The conventional fictional image we have of dinosaurs is of terrifying creatures emerging from prehistoric graves to wreak havoc on modern civilization. The very thing that threatens humanity overcrowding and overdevelopment would make our world a challenge for dinosaurs, like the largest predator of all time, Giganotosaurus. Just imagine a T-Rex, a, a third again as large, and that's pretty, pretty staggering to think about. One of the reasons that we might not see very large creatures now is that there's a lot of sort of habitat segmenting. So a large animal has to stay alive from its environment. The places where they lived are basically places that are not all cut up into little blocks. They have quite an area where they can migrate through and they can take advantage of food sources, not just in one small area like we might see today, but in a much more open area where they can, they can really have a much larger home range. Giganotosaurus was big, seven tons in weight, and the length of two African elephants standing end to end. To get that size, he consumed his body weight and flesh on a yearly basis and needed a big plate off of which to eat. Giganotosaurus had all of South America as his trough. For Giganotosaurus, getting so large may have been very helpful due to the fact that it was probably hunting very large animals like titanosaurs. Some of the largest animals to ever have walked on our planet were titanosaurs like Argentinosaurus. So if you're going to hunt extremely large animals, being large yourself is very advantageous. The contrast between T-Rex's and Giganotosaurus's teeth tells the story of Giganotosaurus's fleshy diet. If you look at a Tyrannosaur tooth, you've got basically a very robust tooth. It's a lot like a railroad spike. This thing was probably terrific for crushing bone. Or if you look at Giganotosaurus's tooth, it's a much thinner tooth, highly serrated from edge to edge. This is a meat cutting tooth. To grasp why predator and prey were able to supersize, we need an understanding of paleoecology, the relationship of these animals to their environment 100 million years ago. That animal didn't live just in a vacuum, it lived in an environment. So what was that environment like? And how did that environment change through time? What we're standing on right now, it didn't look like it looked, you know, X number of years ago. That's kind of the story that we're always trying to reconstruct. We're not interested in just collecting fossils as trophies. We're interested in looking at these extinct organisms as a biologist would look today at a raccoon or a, or a chimpanzee. We want to know how they lived, what they ate, who ate them, what, what were their habits. Um, and to do that, you can't just look at the bones, but you have to look at all the organisms that go along with the bones. You have to look at the sediments that go along with the organisms, and then you start to look at the whole paleoecology of this system. And that's, that's where we are today.
Reconstructing the environment that an extinct animal live is basically done through geology. We examine the rocks and look for evidence of whether there were river or lake systems in the area, or whether it was a desert with large dunes. And we also look inside the rocks for plant fossils and for pollen, which gives us some idea of what the flora of the area would have looked like. Patagonia, Argentina in the Cretaceous period 90 million years ago was a paradise for Giganotosaurus. So the Cretaceous, for me, is an exceedingly interesting geological time period. In the last about 250 million years, it's never been warmer on Earth. We've never had higher CO2 levels. Sea level has never been higher. And the result of this was a really productive environment worldwide, just this verdant uh, bounty of plants and animals that existed. All this plant food, this giant salad bowl of the Cretaceous then, resulted in 60 ton, maybe 100 ton herbivores during the Cretaceous period. And if you put all that meat on the table, then you're going to end up with a lot of predators also at the buffet. The mild climate had other size effects. We probably account for the large size in the uh, Cretaceous. Um, in part, at least, uh, from the fact that it was warm. And uh, mammals, like you or I, uh, we use a lot of the energy we get from the food we eat just simply keep ourselves warm. If we didn't have to do that, we could take that same energy and get big. And that's apparently what these reptiles were doing. Everything was a giant. In general, bigger is better. You're better at competing for mates. Uh, you can kind of shove the 80-pound weakling out of the way. Or you can eat larger things, and it takes larger things to eat you. So there's just a lot of advantages in being big. One of the advantages is you simply get to places faster, because if your legs are short, you're just simply slower. Experts can reconstruct an animal's long-lost environment by analyzing the content of the soil it walked on. As a paleontologist, I've worked in Egypt and in the Gobi Desert of China and in Patagonia, but I also come right here to New Jersey, right here to this pit that contains sediment that was deposited about 65 million years ago at the very end of the Cretaceous period, at the end of the time of the dinosaurs. Professor Lacovera and graduate student Jason Shine investigate the mineral composition of the soil in this mining pit. It gives them their first clue to what this spot once was, beachfront property. So the dark green color of this sediment is caused by the mineral composition of this deposit. The mineral that's giving it this color is called glauconite, and glauconite almost always forms in a shallow, productive marine environment. The seafloor was occupied by just a, a plethora of different marine animals, invertebrates and vertebrates. They were walking on the surface, they were digging down into the ground, and they were disturbing the sediment as it was being deposited. That's a process that we call bioturbation. But what we see here is evidence of just a riot of life that was going on at this location. Just a little looking supports this observation. It's a productive fossil site. And here is a vertebra of, I'm guessing, crocodile. We've been here for five minutes, and already we've started to discover 65 million year old crocodiles right here in New Jersey. Experts are able to look at an environment today and figure out what happened in the distant past. It's sort of like CSI, a good sediment geologist is a very sophisticated detective they have a lot of uh, tools at their disposal, from microscopes to, to mass spectrometers, and they can find a lot about a sediment environment by using those tools appropriately. If we watch waves today on a beach, or if we watch a river flowing down a valley, we can see the processes operating there, and we can see that they leave a signature in the sediments that allow us to fingerprint an environment. This sediment here is ancient, but it's unconsolidated unlithified, as we say. It could also be the case that groundwater going through this sediment could precipitate out minerals between the grains, cement them together, and this could become a sandstone. 
that sandstone could be thrust up into a mountain range and still it would have the fingerprints of its deposition and we would be able to go up into that mountain range and say, oh, shallow marine deposit near a coast. The present is the key to the past. And just as understanding an animal's environment leads to deductions about its life, analysis of a creature's bones can tell us about its environment. When you look at specific details, the chemical composition of their bones, and the specific isotopes of certain elements like oxygen, carbon that are trapped in their bones, they tell us a tremendous amount about what they ate and what the climate was like. And so there's lots of ways you can now narrow down a lot of uh, older ideas about animals and say, okay, these things are now reasonable, these things we've ruled out. Yesterday's ideas about dinosaurs are constantly changing based on new environmental work. For example, the profile of Spinosaurus, a seven-ton mega carnivore from the Cretaceous period in Africa, has recently been revised. You might have seen portrayals of Spinosaurus as being this really gung-ho predator that might jump on the backs of other dinosaurs, etc. Well, we know now from uh, environmental work that Spinosaurus lived in a mangrove swamp about 95 million years ago, and it probably ate fish. And in fact, it had six-foot spines coming off of its vertebra that don't appear to have been flexible. It probably would have been a, a fairly cautious animal as opposed to sort of a cartoonish version of it. So if you don't understand the environment of that animal, you really don't understand the animal. The more bizarre the creature, the harder it may be for scientists to truly understand behavior. Using CT scans, scientists venture inside the giant heads of these lethal predators. At the dawn of the Cenozoic era, a new South American super predator stepped in to fill the vacancy atop the food chain caused by the extinction of the dinosaurs. Starting 58 million years ago, the forest racidae who reached heights of nine feet, chased down prey at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour. They have been nicknamed terror birds for their fierceness. We can sort of look at the terror birds and we can sort of see in them almost a re-evolution of many of the attributes that we see in some of these more conventional predatory dinosaurs. Terror birds aren't quite as big as Tyrannosaurus, but they're still, for birds, gigantic, bipedal animals running around on two legs, but then also very much head dominant, pushing three feet in length. That's an enormous, ridiculously large skull. Um, these animals were probably very much Tyrannosaur-like, using their heads more than other parts of their anatomy as the killing and manipulating organ. But curiously, this family of birds gave up flight and returned to the ground. Yet it does seem really counterintuitive to, have, to evolve this, this mode of locomotion that seems so, so wonderful, flight, to actually get rid of it and become flightless. Researchers speculate that terror birds gave up flight because it allowed them to develop large, reinforced skulls suited for capturing and dismembering animals, but too heavy for flight. They have really, really huge heads for any bird. And most of that head is this big, long, very deep, very sharp beak with a big hook on the end. You don't see that except in birds that are predatory. There's no reason for a non-predatory bird to have a big, sharp hook at the end. And especially a skull that size, the beak that rigid and that robust, it only makes sense if they're cutting and breaking very large things, uh, large cuts of meat. The skull of Vandal Galornis, a five-foot-tall terror bird that lived five million years ago, illustrates the stark difference between birds that can fly and those who can't. And we can see that it's actually set up quite a bit different from some of the other skulls that we can see in this area here. For instance, this right here is the skull of an eight-foot-tall ostrich, and this is the skull of maybe a five-foot-tall terror bird. We can see this is dramatically different than what we see in this ostrich. The Andogalornis skull also dramatically differs in structure. In front view, 
you can really get a sense of how narrow the snout is. So they have a very tall, very narrow snout, which has a big impact on the function or the biomechanics, really the architecture of how these skulls are built. What that suggests is that this skull is really built for, in a sense, biting down, and also for tearing, pulling back. So this hook beak right here, which would be covered in a horny substance, would actually dig into the prey, then the neck would pull back and retract the entire skull, which would impart sort of a ripping or tearing movement. What's really interesting is if we actually CAT scan this guy, get inside and really see how he's constructed. What we'll do is we'll scan it pretty much in, in, in life position here. At Oblenis Memorial Hospital in Athens, Ohio, Chief CT technologist Heather Rockhold helps Dr. Whitmer prepare to scan. All set? Yep. All right, let's go have a look. Okay. When we use something like CT scanning to look inside the skull of an extinct animal, what we see are basically the bones and the spaces within the bones and around the bones. The brain is long gone. Time has stripped that away. However, what we can do is still look at what the brain cavity tells us. And the brain cavity itself uh, records the general shape of the brain. Huh, that's interesting. Here in the back part of the brain, so this must be the cerebellar region in there. What we see there is that the cerebrum is, is actually quite, quite large and has large visual sensory areas within the cerebrum. These attributes indicate to experts that detecting odors was not that important for terror birds. That's interesting. That's sort of Though exciting. these animals would not have turned down a malodorous scavenged meal, they primarily hunted down live prey. The delicate canals of the inner ear, which are buried deep inside here, what those show us is that this two-part function of the inner ear, the one function associated with equilibrium or the sense of balance, the other with hearing, both of those are very well developed, suggesting that balance and sensing turning movements of the head, which is what the top part of the inner ear does, was very sophisticated in this animal. This animal actually was able to sense subtle turning movements of the head and probably employed relatively rapid and quick turning movements to keep its eyes fixed on potentially fast-moving prey. Now we're getting up into the beak. The CT scan of the snout reveals something unexpected. That's interesting. It's like a cavity in the beak there. It's totally hollow. Given the lifestyle of this animal as a predator and how narrow it is, we would have predicted that this hollow space would have been buttressed internally by struts. We don't see that. That cried out for explanation. In fact, that explanation was kind of long coming because it had us, had us really surprised. Scientists now speculate that Andalgalornis clapped its jaws together to create a low frequency sound. Low frequency sounds have the interesting property is that they can propagate over long distances, even sort of over rough or, or, or heavily forested terrain. Certainly, this sort of chattering of the jaws with this deep wooden uh, resonating chamber in the snout could have been important for courtship, but it also could have been important for communication over long distances. These are not the kind of things that we can answer for sure, but one interesting thing is that the CT scanning actually raised this whole issue um, altogether. The CT scans also indicated something scientists never thought they could predict, the posture of these prehistoric animals when they were wary. There was a clue to this locked deep inside their skulls. When animals are alert, like when a twig snaps, they tend to orient their head in a very characteristic posture. And it turns out that that posture is in such a position that a particular part of the inner ear is oriented horizontally, level with the horizon. In reality, animals spend a lot of time being alert. And so the fact of the matter is we can now reconstruct the alert posture of these animals. For instance, for, for some of these pterosaurs, it turns out that some of them held their heads horizontally when they were alert. But others, it turns out that they actually held their heads strongly nose down. Their heads were very steeply inclined when they were alert. 
kind of makes sense because what it means then, if we put it in this orientation and look at it in head view, this crest right here actually will sort of block the vision. By dropping the head down, it'll actually allow vision to be much more enhanced and actually visual field overlap, which enhances binocular vision. Though CT scanning allows scientists to reconstruct the brains of extinct animals, they still turn to modern animals to attempt to reconstruct fine details, like the way flesh interacts with bone. We've always looked at the skulls of these dinosaurs and seen holes and grooves and things like that. And for a long time, they didn't seem to really carry much significance to us. We knew that maybe there was probably blood vessels and nerves, but we couldn't really make any sense of that. What really allowed us to sort of put the pieces together, we're actually looking at the modern relatives of these animals. Dr. Whitmer dissects modern specimens in an effort to reconstruct the soft tissues of the dinosaurs. We're really trying to sort of flesh things out and see what these animals were like. We really need to look at animals that are around today that still have those soft tissues that we're trying to reconstruct in the dinosaurs. Fortunately, we've got some resources right here. Got a walk-in freezer with all kinds of critters in it. And we really have a whole host of animals in here. Everything ranging from crocodiles to rhinos. We've got loons but we'll actually probe these animals, strip off the flesh, literally, to see how it interacts with the bone. Then we'll take that information, go back to the fossils, and really start to sort things out. But these are critical players in that whole process. Understanding the musculature and the vascular and nervous systems of modern animals allows him to reconstruct how tissue interacted with bone in the past. All of a sudden, the fossils look different. All of a sudden, it's not just a random collection of holes and grooves. All of a sudden, conceptually anyways, there are blood vessels and nerves coming through those holes and grooves. And not just any blood vessels and nerves, but nerves and blood vessels that we know and understand. Though terror birds were aggressive predators, they would have had no chance against this huge herbivore. It lumbered across South America for two million years before it mysteriously became extinct. There's something decidedly medieval about Doodicarus. Maybe it's his rhinoceros-like size. 3,000 pounds of flesh supported by feet that are barely visible beneath his bulk, kind of like a moving fortress. Or perhaps it's that chainmail armor, 1,800 bony plates concealing a deep layer of fat that acts like a shock absorber in battle. Or it could be that spiked mace-like tail that can be wielded against other males during mating season. And, of course, against predators. It was a plant eater and it was a big Volkswagen shaped animal that probably was not swift. A pretty amazing defense mechanism though. Who would, who would want to have him for lunch? They couldn't really take a bite. It had a huge domed bony shell it's completely covered its entire body, especially when it's squatted down on the ground. Doodicarus was not built for beauty, certainly not for speed, but he was built to last. In fact, he managed to survive for most of the past two million years. But like the rest of his sturdy Pleistocene cast, the mammoth, the saber tooth, and the woolly rhino, he disappeared within the last 11,000 years. Scientists are searching for the cause of these great beasts' disappearance. Why did such hardy creatures, also known as the mammalian megafauna, become extinct? Not surprisingly, the answer isn't simple. It begins with the concept of extinction, which on the positive side, creates opportunity. The rise of the mammalian megafauna wouldn't have been possible were it not for the extinction of the dinosaurs. And to examine this idea, it's, it's instructive to think about the idea of niche, a biological niche. You can think of a niche essentially as the job description of an organism. Uh, not just who was it, but what did it eat? Who ate it? What was its environment? Its behaviors? Its physiology? And all of those things together combine to make the niche of an organism. The dinosaurs had taken all the good jobs during the Cretaceous period. 
Their extinction made room for new blood. All of the non-avian dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago, and essentially there are all these environmental job descriptions now lying vacant. And this time it's the mammals that step up, uh, go through this burst of evolution and diversification, and then you see mammals occupying niches that were formerly occupied by dinosaurs. Doodicarus was likely better equipped to handle one-on-one -on -one combat than changes in the weather. When we talk about extinction, uh, we should realize that change is bad. Organisms are uh, evolved specifically for a certain habitat. And anything that changes that habitat is not likely to be good for them. So the first rule of extinction is change, no matter what it is, it's a bad thing. The so-called Ice Age extinction, lasting from approximately 13,000 to 9,000 years ago, wiped out many different kinds of animals, including Doodicarus, mammoths, saber-toothed cats, and woolly rhinos. Its cause has long been a subject of debate in the scientific community. Ever since the days of Darwin, when they first started finding these large Ice Age mammals that were clearly no longer around, people have speculated as to why they all went extinct. There are competing theories. One prominent one, the overkill theory, postulates that the human expansion into more habitats put pressure on other mammal species. The so-called Clovis people moved from Asia into North America perhaps as early as 14,000 years ago, bringing with them flint spearheads for hunting large game. Especially in North America, there is a close correspondence between the last radiocarbon dates on the Big Ice Age mega mammals and the first appearance of humans with Clovis points that came over from the Bering Land Bridge from Asia. And so the overkill school says that all these naive North American large mammals had never had a predator like humans, and that when humans came, they probably wiped them out. But there are certainly problems with the idea that humans wiped out everything. Uh, the biggest problem of which is that we don't have evidence that they actually hunted a lot of these animals. And it's very odd that certain animals that they don't seem to have hunted at all died out and that there's no reason to think they would die out. Some scientists theorize that climate change, a rapid warming that brought on the mild climate that we have now, disrupted habitats and caused the extinction. This is also a time of great climatic change. It's the rapid transition from the last glacial to the present interglacial, which we're in right now. And that event took place very rapidly. We're talking about uh, major shifts in just decades. Scientists believe that climate change can't entirely explain the extinction because there had been other cold and warm snaps during the Pleistocene that didn't lead to mass extinction. My feeling is that it's probably the case where people like simple answers, but nature isn't so simple. The most accepted theory now is that there was a combination of climate change and overhunting that brought on mass extinction. There are certainly climatic stresses going on, and uh, maybe humans are just like tip of the iceberg, or they pick on certain animals, especially like mammoths and bison, uh, and might have you know, pushed some of those, like mammoths, to extinction. When you talk about theories of extinction, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, extinction may be severe because two or three of these factors came into play at the same time. Extinction, though it often wipes out creatures that survived and adapted for millions of years, is a partner to evolution. Evolution doesn't actually produce the best possible solution, it only produces a better solution. And if, in fact, we didn't have extinctions, probably what would happen is that evolution would pretty much grind to a halt. And so we might find ourselves in a similar ecosystem that was around in, for example, the Jurassic, and we might be living in the shadow of dinosaurs. It's only extinctions that give an opportunity to roll the evolutionary dice one more time. As a result of this, we might get something new and perhaps even better than we had before. Scientists are continually confronted with the bones of bizarre creatures. How do they approach something they haven't seen before? 
Most often, paleontologists dig up the bones of a partial skeleton. The rest of the remains have been eaten by predators, scattered by a shifting geology, or simply eroded from exposure. These partial remains present basic questions about the creature. Why was it designed in this way? What behavior can be inferred about the beast that wore these bones? Paleontologists are faced with these challenges every day. But how does this work in practice? What are the first things a scientist does when faced with a set of mysterious, synonymous bones? Presented with an animal like this, it's a really good question is to see if we can figure out what kind of animal it was, how it, how it lived its life. Certainly it's a very interesting sort of animal. Looking at the structure of the teeth is, is one of the first things we can do to see what an animal was like and, and what it did. One thing that's remarkable about these teeth is these are the teeth of a predator. Not only are they sort of sharp and pointy, but a key feature is that they're actually directed backwards. So we call that recurve. It's actually very similar to what we see in the teeth uh, on the skull of Velociraptor right here. What that means, if you're a prey item, is that it's pretty easy to get in, but it's pretty tough to get out. Another attribute that we can see by looking at this is this animal had really big jaw muscles. This whole cavity in here is absolutely enormous for a skull of this size, and all of these muscles sat right down in here. What that suggests is that whatever it was biting, whatever prey organism, it was actually biting it very hard. This skull looks like a reptile to me, but it's, it's not a dinosaur. Dinosaurs had a particular hole in the skull between the eye socket, which is here, and the nasal openings here. It is a reptile, but it's not a dinosaur. A really interesting thing actually relates to this structure right here in the nose. This is a very unusual kind of structure that is actually related to sort of a funny kind of sense of smell in, the, in that it's sensing chemicals. This is actually uh, something that we call a vomeronasal organ. And it's not regular smell. Regular smell is actually very far back in the nasal cavity. This is actually a, a special kind of, of organ that's involved with actually tasting smells. Seeing this in this animal right here tells me that this animal probably, almost certainly, had a forked tongue. So I'm going to take this skull and try to flesh it out, try to, try to put some flesh on the bones and do my recreation of whatever this creature must have looked like. I can see a big eye socket there. He looks like he had fairly large eyes. Give him a nice sort of reptilian slit pupil look there. Straight mouth. He has sort of a curving lower jaw. Give him a sort of a reptilian sort of dewlap down there. There are some other features here. For example, on the lower jaw, this is actually a hinge. And this animal can flex its lower jaw downward as it opens its mouth, which allows it to stretch and bend the lower jaw down. This is a feature unique to just a few families of lizards. But there's little speculation left for Dr. Whitmer. The nose structure leads to a positive identification. This is not an iguana. This is not a gecko. This is a monitor lizard, because this is a very specialized kind of nose structure that we find really only in monitor lizards. From there, the next question is, is what kind of monitor lizard is it? There's lots and lots of different kinds. Based on the size of this, I would suggest it's almost certainly a Komodo dragon, which is the largest living lizard today. A monster from the present. A Komodo dragon weighs in at around 150 to 300 pounds. They are the top predators on the Komodo Islands in Indonesia. They hunt fairly large mammals, and their way of hunting is to jump out on a game trail and quickly put a bite on a prey. They have in their saliva clostridium bacteria, which are toxic. So even if it only gets a nip on the animal and the animal gets away, it's infected the wound with a bacterium that will kill the animal in two or three days. They can ingest up to 80% of their body weight in one meal. Komodo dragons may swallow smaller prey whole. Their ancestors are ancient and can be traced back to about 100 million years ago in Central Asia. We can explore both their lineage and behavior by taking a closer look at their brains. 
certainly one of the key things that we need to do and try to sort out how this animal lived its life is actually run this thing through a CT scanner so we can see inside, get back to this area, the brain cavity, and see what kind of structures that we might be able to see. Okay, this will be interesting. This is actually the skull of a Komodo dragon. So it's not a dinosaur, um, but it's still really interesting for us to look at, partly because it's the largest living lizard. Let's give it a go. The scan reveals modest-sized cerebral hemispheres, indicating an animal that lives by instinct. 